This morning we're going to go back to Romans chapter 14 where we were last week. Romans chapter 14. We started studying what Romans 14 has to say about loving one another as we determine God's will for our life. That's one of the big principles, obviously, that Jesus said all the law hangs on. Love God with all your heart and then love one another. And we saw three principles last week. First, don't provide a stumbling block to others in anything that you choose to do. Because providing a stumbling block not only causes others to sin, but it causes you to sin as well. Second, ensure everything that you do is for the edification of other people. Building them up in Christ. And then third, do not judge one another. We're going to read through this passage again. You'll see those as we review. But in the context of judging, this morning we're going to take a look at the charge of legalism and how that has affected Christians and the church and how we can avoid it. But we're going to read Romans 14 again. So if you'll follow along as I read this chapter. Romans chapter 14, starting at verse 1. It says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. For who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it to the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he does not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not, therefore, judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, To him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith we may edify one another. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything, whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Let's pray, and then we'll look at our message here. Father, thank you again for your word and your direction in these things about how to love one another, and specifically this area, Lord, about judging other people. Lord, we are all guilty of it. And we need to be forgiven. We need to understand how it affects us and how it affects others and how it violates your principles and your truth. 
of loving one another. So Lord, just lead us and guide us as we look through this passage today. Father, I need your help to preach this message. I need your words, your strength, your wisdom. So fill me with your spirit, I pray now. Give me strength from above. Give me the words to say so that we might be taught by you and understand your truth together. And we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we started this chapter last week. We looked at those three principles that I already mentioned about how those are all part of loving one another. And again, this is all in the context of what is God's will for our life. And God's will is, as we broke it down, to love him first, to love other people. And we looked at principles that come out of each of those broader principles. And this, these principles here in Romans chapter 14 are focused on the idea of how do we love one another and what are those things that cause us not to love one another. And as we ended last week, we were looking at this idea of not judging one another because we're supposed to edify. It's two sides of the coin. The negative, do not judge. The positive, edify. Negative, do not provide a stumbling block. So there's two negatives, one positive, but they all work together. Now, I want to remind you again that this third principle that we looked at, don't judge one another, is what happens when we start applying all of these truths to everyone else and not to ourselves. God did not give us his word so that we could find this truth and say, oh, well, that person's not doing it, that person's not doing it, that person's not doing it. His word is given to each one of us so that we can look at our own lives and say, wow, I have really fallen short. I'm still not where God wants me to be, and so I need God's help to help me to continue to grow. It's about self-evaluation. But when we apply it to other people, then we get in this area of judging other people. Now, here's the problem, is because none of us are perfect, it's easy to find fault in other people. And we will. You can. And you do. Because you're a human being. You know that you're not perfect, but to make yourself feel better, you look at other people and say, oh, well, they're less perfect than I am. That's judging. And that's exactly what both Paul and Jesus are commanding us not to do. Do not compare yourself and say, oh, well, I'm a little more spiritual than that person, so that person is bad. I am good. No, nobody's good, the Bible says. And so we have no place to be able to judge other people. We can't use our judgment of other people to make us feel better about our own failures. And so lots of people do that. They will judge others, look at the evil in others, and then that justifies their own failures because I'm not quite as bad as that person. When you think about sin, I think most of what comes in our mind originally or immediately is the big ones, right? The Ten Commandments, adultery, murder, lying. Well, some of us don't consider that a big one, but it is, okay? Lying, coveting. That's another big one, okay? But that's what comes to our mind, the big stuff. And you go, oh, well, I'm not guilty of murder. I'm not guilty of adultery. I'm not guilty of these big sins. And so that makes me a pretty good Christian. But when you break it down into, no, God actually isn't saying, just don't do these things. He's saying your life should be characterized by a love for him first and a love for others better uh, second then we start to realize, no, I don't love God the way I should, and I don't love others the way I should, and then none of us are innocent. We all become guilty under that measure. And so we can't judge other people because we're not in a position to judge. But we become like the Pharisee who prayed in the temple, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people. See, that's the attitude from which judgment comes, because you're comparing yourself to others. If you're going to compare yourself, compare yourself to Jesus Christ. And then you'll realize how bad you really are. Jesus was perfect. He's the model. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't look at your boyfriend. Don't look at your husband or wife. Don't look at your family members. Don't look at friends. Look at Jesus. If you want to understand what you really are, look at him and then look at yourself. And that's what Paul is saying we need to do. 
Don't look at other people. Don't judge. But there's another part of judging others in which our lack of love is manifested, and we use ourselves as the victim. Now, we don't think of this as judging, but I want you to understand this principle because it's the same attitude, the same pride, really, that's behind judging others and thinking that we're better than them. This part of judging, I'll call the victim mentality because we judge other people and we say, well, the Bible says you're supposed to love one another and you're not loving me. I'm suffering because you have failed. I am receiving pain, or I have been offended, or I have received some kind of hurt in my life because you are not doing what you're supposed to be doing. That is as much judgment as looking at other people and just telling them, you're bad, I'm good. If we adopt this victim mentality, that is judging other people. Because again, we're applying the principles of Scripture to somebody else and telling them that they're not good enough and now we're suffering because of it. What motivates that is the same thing that motivates what we'll call normal judgmentalism is pride. I'm at the focus and I'm not getting what I need from you. And so now I am suffering. If we truly love one another, do we go around making other people feel guilty because of what they failed to do on our behalf? No, if you read 1 Corinthians 13, if you read all the passages in Scripture about how we love one another, love is kind and forgives others for their failures. It forgives others for the hurt that they've caused us. It doesn't make them guilty as I become the victim. And so it's pride that motivates any kind of judgment. And second of all, if you understand that becoming a victim, you're judging other people, it also is not, you're not the one that the person is accountable to. They are accountable to God. Look at verse 2 this morning, or verse 12 this morning in Romans chapter 14. He says very clearly, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now, he doesn't say every one of us shall give account of himself to each other. He says we give account of ourselves to God. So none of us is in the place to look at someone else, even if it's affected us personally, to say, oh, well, you failed, and so now I'm suffering. That's pride, because it focuses on me. Now, we are to admonish, to exhort, to correct one another in truth, And in love, and last week we looked at the passage that says, if a brother be caught in a fault or in a sin, you go to him and you try to restore him with an attitude of meekness. In other words, I'm not better than you, I fail too. Let me help you. But we don't go and make them guilty because they've hurt me. That's pride just as much as judging in another way is pride. So all judging of others really comes down to a lack of love for them. And that's our failure, okay? And that's why we apply these principles to me, not to everybody else. So there's different manifestations of judging one another. They're all wrong because they're all not loving one another as Jesus told us to. But I want to focus the rest of my time this morning on one version of judging others that has been rampant in the church since the beginning of the church, okay? And we call it legalism. Now, legalism is not a biblical word. It's not a word that's in Scripture. You won't find it if you try to do a search for it. But there's many examples of legalism in Scripture. And we see here that Paul, I'm going to show you how Paul talks about it, especially in the first part of this chapter. Some examples that we find of legalism in Scripture are when the Pharisees criticized Jesus and his disciples, because when they ate, they did not always follow the regular Jewish ritual of cleansing of hands. It happened on multiple occasions. And Jesus criticized them because they were focused on the cleansing of hands rather than the cleansing of their heart. But they criticized because of an outward conduct that was expected, according to their law, And Jesus wasn't fulfilling it. 
If you go back to the beginning of the church, right after the church began, Jewish believers were telling Gentile believers that in order to be a true follower of God, if you want to truly worship God, you have to get circumcised. You basically have to become a Jew. You have to follow the laws. You have to celebrate the feast days, all of these things. That's why Paul mentions that here in Romans 14. One man regardeth the day, one man does not regard the day. That's what he's talking about. And so that's what the Jews were saying. And the, the Jewish Christians in the early church, when Gentiles got saved, they said, oh, now you've got to become like us. You have to meet this standard. In the whole book of Galatians, Paul wrote to combat that thinking that, well, no, you have to meet our standard. You have to become like me in order to be accepted by God. And Paul, through Galatians, keeps saying, no, that's not true. We are made whole in Jesus Christ. It's not about our performance or our policies that we follow. It's about the grace of God that saves us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we all become one in Christ. So we don't have to become all like each other. and We don't have to follow all the rituals of the law to prove that we are a follower of God. That proof will come out naturally as the Spirit does His work in us. And so that was happening right at the beginning of the church. So that, and that was legalism. And it's something that has done great damage to the church all through history. Now, let's define it. What is legalism? Well, I've cut a couple different definitions, but let me just try to explain it. One definition says legalism is an attempt to gain favor with God or to impress our fellow man by doing certain things or avoiding other things without regard to the condition of our heart. In other words, outward actions without an inward change. Outward conformity to some standard without any inward truth or submission. I think that's a good definition. Basically, it's a performance of holiness without real holiness. We can't make ourselves holy. We, can't, we don't become more holy as we do certain things or live a certain way. That's not how it works. The Holy Spirit does his work in us to convict us of things in our life as we seek his way. And he changes our character in more into the character of Jesus Christ. And we become more holy as we submit ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit. But holiness is not gained by doing outward things. In Luke chapter 11, verse 39, Jesus defined the problem this way. He's talking to the Pharisees. He said, now, do ye Pharisees may clean the outside of the cup and the platter. You wash the outside of the dish, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Again, he says, you're focused on the outward conduct. Now, it's not that the outward conduct doesn't matter, but Jesus says the more important thing is what's happening inside. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, uh, Paul understood that legalism was a real problem. And he's talking to Timothy, and he says, here's these kind of people. They have a form of godliness, an outward conduct, but they deny the power thereof. In other words, they look religious. They look like good people, good Christians even but they don't have the power of God in them. There's something missing on the inside. So basically, legalism is religious activity that is void of God's truth and God's power. At its basis, and we'll put it in the context of judging then, it's judging someone else's salvation or your own salvation based on a list of policies and standards that are not defined in Scripture or that you think are defined in Scripture. If you judge somebody's life or salvation by how they keep the law, like the, the early Christians, Jewish Christians were doing, that's legalism. In its application, it would be demonstrated by trying to force your own standard on someone else in judgment of them. And that's why we're looking at this in the context of judging other people, because that's where it ends up. 
It's a fake religion that we perform to convince people that we are good, but then our fake religion and what we think the standard should be, we start to apply to other people and look at them and say, well, you don't meet the standard. You're not as good as I am. And that's where legalism comes in. Now, as we discussed, judging others is wrong because in judging them, we're not loving them. And rather than helping others understand and apply God's principles, a legalist will judge and criticize other people based on their own policies or their own convictions. It's basically saying, I've got it figured out and you don't, so you need to listen to me and live the way I tell you to. Okay? And again, you can see, that's pride. It's not love, it's pride. Legalists feel good when they can identify another person's errors. It reinforces their feelings of superiority, and they actually think that they're more spiritual or more godly because they live a certain way. They've received more favor from God. God loves them more because I live a certain way. Now, that's absolutely not true. The Pharisees are a perfect example of this, again. Okay? God knows what's going on inside of our hearts. That's what matters. Now, I'm not saying the out, outward conduct doesn't matter, but legalism is when we have the outward conduct without any inward spirituality, really. Jesus defined legalism in a sense when he condemned the Pharisees for their fake religious performances in Matthew 23. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. You've omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done and not leave the other undone. Then he goes on, he says, You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. And I think that phrase right there sums up a legalist perfectly. Straining at the gnats in other people's lives while all along swallowing a camel. Jesus put it another way. He also said, You're so worried about the speck in someone else's eye but not concerned about the beam or the log that's in your own. And that defines a legalist perfectly. Again, the Pharisees are the best example. They force their own rules on everyone else, judge them by those rules, rather than the principles of Scripture. They did it with Jesus. They did it with Jesus' disciples. They did it with everybody. And so the people of Israel of Jesus' time were afraid of how the Pharisees would look at them. They became so concerned in their mind that they wouldn't live up to the Pharisees' standard that they literally would hide sometimes when the Pharisees came walking down the street so they wouldn't be condemned. And it didn't matter what the Pharisees say or, or not say. It would be the fact that they knew they didn't quite meet up to that standard and so they would feel guilty and demeaned and not good enough. Because they didn't meet the Pharisee standard. Now, all of us should feel guilty and nothing when we look at Christ as the standard, and then we realize how much we need it. But that should not happen when we look at people. And that's why it's so wrong to compare ourselves with people. Paul was probably thinking of the Pharisees and people like them when he wrote in, in this chapter that we read this morning in verse 10, he says, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And he says, you look at people with contempt. And that's exactly the way Pharisees looked at other people. That's exactly what a legalist will do to other people. I am better than you. You don't meet up to the standard. And so you are a lower Christian, a lesser Christian. Let me instruct you on how to be better. And that, I think, sums up legalism kind of in a nutshell. Here's what both sides of legalism sounds like. It's not just the ones who judge, it's the ones who feel judged by other people. One side will say, well, we figured out how to live freely in our Christian liberty, but you other people, you're still stuck in bondage to all those rules and policies. So we can be free. We're free in Christ. We don't have to worry about the law of the Old Testament. We're free from that. Christ fulfilled it. We're okay. We can do whatever we want. And so why are you so uptight about how you're living? That's one side, and that's what it sounds like. The other side 
says, well, you people have no discipline. You have no holiness because you are so much more liberal than what I believe the Bible tells us we should be. Now, you know, if you listen to both of those statements, that both of them are statements of judgment of other people. And that's why both sides are wrong. Whether you look at yourself as better than someone else or whether you feel judged by someone else, that's legalism. The only judge we have is Christ. And so when someone else judges you, even as the victim, our response in love is, I feel sorry for that person. I'm going to forgive him and I'll pray for him. Not, oh, you made my life so miserable. Oh, I'm so hurt. No, that's pride because we're focused on ourselves. And so that's just as much legalism and judgmentalism as looking at other people as lesser than you. Now, it's important that we become that we not become legalistic in judging everybody else by our standard. Remember, we talked about how policies interfere with our ability to both understand and practice the principles of God in our life. And so we can't become judgmental. We can't become legalists either in accusing other people of doing wrong according to our standard or of feeling like we don't meet up to other people's standards. Because in both places, we have made man the judge rather than God. God is our judge, not anyone here or anyone in our lives. You are not the judge of others. Others are not the judge of you. God is the judge of your spiritual condition. He alone is the one that you will answer to. Now, let me give you some problems with legalism. First, that attitude makes mountains out of molehills. It elevates the, the menial to the crucial, the unimportant to the important. In other words, it focuses on things that are not the most important spiritual issues in a person's life. Okay, And the common areas that fall under this idea of legalism that are always brought up over and over are are focused on outward conduct. And it is in the areas, the, what we call the gray areas. It's, well, I don't think that person should be dressed that way. Oh, I don't think that person should be drinking. I don't think that person should do this or should do that or listen to that kind of music or watch this kind of TV or go to the movies or et cetera. You've heard it all. Okay? Who am I to say what you should or shouldn't do? Now, if we're going to encourage each other in truth, we can say, God has given us truth. Read the Bible and find out what God wants you to do. Okay, and that's what we do every here, every day, every Sunday here, as we get together. We're gonna look at the Bible and see, okay, these are the principles God has given us. So how should we practice them in our lives? But I'm not here, and nobody is in your life for to tell you, oh, these are the kind of clothes you have to wear, and this is the kind of music you have to listen to, and these are the places you shouldn't, shouldn't go. That's between you and God. But legalism makes mountains out of molehills. And look at verse 7 in chapter 14 here. Paul says, For none of us liveth to himself. I'm sorry, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. If you are more concerned about what people eat then you aren't about their spiritual condition, you're a legalist. If you're more concerned about what people wear than about the true condition of their heart, then you're a legalist. If you are more concerned about what you wear than about the condition of your heart, then you're a legalist. That's what Paul's saying here. We elevate the trivial to become the most important things, and then we use those so-called important things to look at other people and judge them by them. And we don't know the condition of their heart. And so it's all outward. In verse 20, Paul says this, For me, one of these small things, one of these menial things, it does affect us, but he says, For me, destroy not the work of God. If you're going to harp on something small in somebody's life that is your pet peeve because it annoys you that they do things a certain way or 
you just, oh, you know, they're, they're awful sinners because they do it this way. And that's all you talk about. And that's all you tell them about. And you judge them continually because of that certain thing. Then you violated this principle of loving one another. We judge other people. And Paul says in verse 20, you're not just judging, you're destroying God's work in people's lives. Go back to verses 5 and 6. He gives us this other example. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it to the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he does not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. He eateth not to the Lord, he, giveth, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. So Paul's saying here, in, in these two verses, here's the principle that we need to follow to avoid legalism. Stop elevating the unimportant to be the most important. If you, and, and he uses these two, we'll call them insignificant issues, because it's not a measure of our spirituality. But he says, if you decide to celebrate the holy days of Israel as a Christian, okay, go ahead. That's between you and God. I've, I've heard pastors say, Christians shouldn't celebrate the Passover because the Passover was fulfilled at the cross, and if we celebrate the Passover, we keep going back before the cross and all of this stuff. And I'm like, well, what about Romans chapter 14? It's between you and God. Why do you do it? Why do you celebrate it? We can apply this to holidays, all right? Christmas, there's some people who don't celebrate Christmas. That's fine. In our heart, we celebrate whatever the holiday is, to God, for God's glory. But we need biblical principles from God's word why we do it. See, and that's the problem with legalism. Many times, because we're trying to conform to a standard that somebody else has set, like the Pharisees did, we just do it, but we don't know why. We have no motivation other than, oh, well, that because that's what this person does, or that's what this church expects, or, or that's what this group wants me to be, and so that's what I'll do. But unless we are convinced from Scripture with God's principles that this is the way we should do something, and this is why we should do something, then we basically become a legalist, even though we're doing the right things. You have to have the support of God's Word in your life for everything you do. There are principles in God's word that guide us in everything we do, even, Paul says, keeping holidays. But he says, don't judge one another because you do it different than somebody else. And so it makes little things into big things. That's what legalism does. In Matthew 23, I already read these verses. Jesus condemned the Pharisees as hypocrites because they were so concerned about tithing. And they would tithe their spices. They literally would pour them out and then separate 10 parts and then take one part, exact, measure it to the, the fraction of an ounce. And exact, that's how much. One tenth has to be exactly one tenth, and I'm going to do this. Okay. See, that's the letter of the law. And he said, you do that. You're so concerned about that, but you forget about judgment. And he's not talking about judging other people. He's talking about justice, mercy, and faith how we treat other people. And he says, don't forget about the little things, but start thinking about the big things, about loving one another. The Pharisees got so concerned about the little things, tithing down to the last penny, the last ounce, but they had no concern about loving other people. And see, that's what happens to a legalist. So legalism tends to set, focus on secondary issues, I'll call them, minute things in the lives of other people and not the real spiritual problem or just encouraging one another. Second, legalism elevates itself above God because I become the standard. My opinions, my interpretation and application of Scripture are the only right ways. Then it doesn't matter what God really intended or what God really said. This is what I want it to be and this is how I will judge others. And so if I think the Bible says this, then everybody else has to live that way as well. And so it's my way becomes the right way instead of God's way being the right way. Now, legalists will say, well, no, it is God's way. 
This is what the Bible says, and this is how I see it there. Well, the, yeah, it's the second part that you run into problems, okay? It doesn't matter how you see it. It's what God's actually saying. And unfortunately, most of the people who I would consider to be legalists have their own version and own interpretation of what Scripture actually is saying. And that's where they get to where they are. But a legalist has to always prove he is right in his own position. This is what I believe, and let me show you why. And therefore, you must also agree with me on this. And so it's an elevation of myself above what God actually says. In my opinion, my preference, my interpretation, my application, then becomes absolute truth for everybody else. Now, we could call that pride, but in essence, that's also idolatry. Because you've replaced God. And then if you follow someone like that, oh, they become the standard for me, that's also idolatry. So never decide to do something in your life, regardless of how small it is, just because, well, that's the way someone else does it. That's idolatry. And some of you may be thinking, well, that's pretty extreme to call it idolatry. In its essence, that's what it is. You've elevated something or someone else in your life above God's place that he should, be, that he should take. God should be the, the one who is our judge. He is the one who gives us truth. It is through Jesus Christ that we have the example. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who leads us and guides us into all truth. But if we use somebody else as our standard, that's idolatry. And so legalism ends up becoming idolatry on both sides because God is not the primary source, the supreme source of all truth. He's not the judge and the standard. I mean, he's important, but now it's all about someone else. Third, legalism becomes a stumbling block to others. Now, remember last week we said, this is one that Paul says very clearly, don't do this because it's not showing love to each other. Let me explain. When you elevate your own policies above the principles of God's word, then how are you teaching them to live according to you? Are you right in everything? How many of you are perfect? No. So nobody can actually say, follow me. I'm the standard. Do it the way I do it. Right? <clears throat> now, since none of us are perfect, if we make ourselves the standard, then we're teaching other people that imperfection, we'll call it a lack of holiness, really, is okay with God. Because I'm good enough, so live like me. That's what God wants for you. Wrong answer. God wants perfection, and only God can accomplish that in us. We'll get that ultimately in heaven. But God's doing that work on a progressive basis as we live our lives and trust him. But if we follow someone else, again, not only are we making them our idol, but now they've become the model for our life. And every time they fall, well, I guess I'm okay if I do this one wrong thing. One time is not going to matter because it's okay for them. And they're, they're like, oh, wow, the epitome of a Christian. See, and so... As we make ourselves the model, we actually present a stumbling block because people are watching us. They're modeling their lives after us because we're so judgmental. They don't want to be cursed and condemned by us. And then an imperfect person becomes the standard and we cause them to live in sin. And Paul addresses this both here in Romans chapter 14 and in 1 Corinthians 8 and chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. And he says, if you eat, um, meat that offends other people, you do it uncharitably and you destroy the work of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he says, you actually sin and you cause the other person to sin. Now, it may be something that we say, oh, you know what? Don't be so uptight about this. Your rules and your policies keep you so restricted. God's given us freedom. And so it's okay to let loose once in a while. It's okay to do this certain thing. But if it's against their conscience and they don't, from God, have a conviction about it, 
or if they have a conviction about it and you try to persuade them otherwise, then you literally are creating a stumbling block. And legalism does that all the time. So we need to be careful about using other people as the standard, whether it be us or someone else that we follow. It's both sides of the coin of legalism. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul says, Beware lest any spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. Now, I'm going to say this very clearly, and I want you to get a, understand this and, and take heed, okay? Don't ever live in a certain way or do a certain thing just because your pastor does it that way. Never. If that's your motivation, because this is the way my pastor does it, or this is what my pastor believes, you're in dangerous territory. All right, you wouldn't want to be like me. The world can only handle one of me anyway. But it's about setting someone up as the standard. That's the problem with legalism. In Titus chapter 1, Paul uh, admonishes and warns a young pastor, and he says, not giving heed to Jewish fables. In other words, you have to become like us. And then he says, and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Legalism makes its own policies and commandments. may not be exactly what God wants. It may be what God wants for a certain person, but it always imposes it and judges other people by it. Now, one more point I want to make about this idea of legalism is just because someone has very strict standards or convictions in some areas of their life that you do not, especially in these areas that we call the gray areas, it doesn't mean that they are automatically the weaker brother or legalistic. Many people will confuse an emphasis on obedience to God with legalism, especially people who want to live in Christian liberty, and so I'm free to do what I want. And they'll call anybody who has more conservative standards a legalist. Um, I know many pastors, I know many Christians, who, and I myself have been accused of being legalistic because I teach people to obey the Word of God. Study the Word, see what it says, and then obey the Word of God. And as I try to do that in my own life, there's certain things that God has led me to do and to not do in a certain way. Now, I'm not going to tell other people, no, because I do it, you have to do it this way. But I'll give you the principles from Scripture that guided me to make the right decision, or the decision where I am now. But just because someone has more conservative or stricter standards than you do does not automatically make them a legalist. The problem is legalism and what I'll call a sincere desire to live in holiness sometimes look very much the same. The problem is the motivation behind it. What causes the person to do what they're doing? It could be very strict standards and a legalist because they want to prove that they're the model for other people to follow. That's pride. That's not loving others. But then a person who lives very much the same way with the same kinds of standards could be sincerely seeking God and in holiness. He's come to these conclusions after much prayer and saying, I believe this is the way God wants me to live. The difference is whether they impose that on other people. So we can't just automatically judge somebody as a legalist because they've adopted for themselves very conservative or strict standards. Now, if they impose it on you and try to judge you by it, that makes them a legalist. It doesn't matter who they are, what the standard is. If, it, if well, I do it this way, so you have to, and I'm going to judge you because of it, that's a legalist. But if they're not forcing your own convictions on you, and they're merely doing what Paul says here at the end of chapter 20, uh, 14, he says, hast thou faith, have it to thyself before God. In other words, what you believe the truth of God tells you to do, do it being accountable to God. Live that way. In, Rome, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he says, if it violates your conscience, then obviously the Holy Spirit has led you to not do certain things, don't do them. Because if you do violate your conscience, what you believe God says is right and wrong, then that's sin. And he says that at the end of chapter 14. Happy is he 
that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. In other words, if I've studied Scripture, if I've asked God to guide me to find the standards of God's principles that I should live by, and then ask God, how am I supposed to carry this out on a day-to-day basis? And God has brought you to a place in your life where you say, okay, these are the things that I think I'm allowed to do within the scriptural principles that I've studied. These are the things that I shouldn't do within those principles. Basically, that's your conscience. Okay? And that's what Paul's saying. And he says, do you have faith in these things? Do you believe it's okay for you to do these things? And he says, great. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which you allow in your life. You're not guilty because you think, according to Scripture, it's okay. But have you studied it? That's the question. Have you prayed about it? That's the question. Have you sought God's will in those things? That's the big question. But when you come to those conclusions after doing all that, and he says, you're happy. But verse 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat. In other words, if God has brought you to conviction that there's certain things in your life you shouldn't do, don't do them, regardless of what other people do. And he says, because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever is not what you believe God has taught in his word for you to follow him in obeying God's commandments, if you do those things that you think God is not allowing, then you're sinning. If you don't do those things that you believe God wants you to do, you're sinning. And so Paul says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. But it's that faith between you and God. It's not based on someone else's opinion. And so legalism is not defined by how strict or liberal your standards are in your life. Legalism is, is defined by imposing your own standards on other and then judging them by it. Now, I'm going to make this point because here's an application of it. Just because a church or a school or an in, institution of some kind adopts a very strict standard in dress and music and entertainment in dating, it doesn't automatically make that institution or church or school a legalist. Many Christian schools and colleges and even some churches are labeled as legalistic because they've adopted a more strict standard, a more conservative standard in these areas, dress, music, dating, etc. Okay? But we have to understand this, that being able to attend, let's just use a Christian college or a Christian school, for instance, it's not a right, it's a privilege. And when you sign up as a student in one of these institutions, you are agreeing to live by the terms that are set out in that agreement. The school operates this way. These are the expectations. If you agree with it, sign on the line. We have the same thing here in our church. People don't become members unless they can agree to our statement of faith. This is what we all believe. We all agree on these things. And then there's not a whole lot of conduct, but basically, you know, you need to be faithful. You need to encourage. You need all of the things we've been talking about. And if you're not going to agree to do that, if you, if you come to the church and say, hey, I want to be a member, but I want to come here so I can cause division. I want to mess this place up. You know, the elders are not going to go, oh, great, we're glad to have you. Sign, join. Okay? But this is the idea when people criticize these institutions or churches or schools or whatever they may be because their standards are strict. Instead of them actually being the legalists that you claim they are, you have become the legalist because you're judging them. Now, there's one other thing I want to add to that, because you can't take all of these principles apart from the rest of Scripture. It all works together. All the principles of Scripture work together, and so you can't isolate one principle and say, oh, I'm going to follow that. Okay? In judging someone else or some church or school or as a legalist, we also have to take into account a little principle called submission. Now, the entire book of 1 Peter, we spent a long time studying 1 Peter. The main message in that book is submission. It's a hallmark of the Christian life. uh, Peter says, submit yourselves to governments. It doesn't matter whether they're good or bad. Obey the laws. As long as they don't violate God's law, obey the laws. 
Submit yourself to your workplace authorities, even if they're abusive and not nice to you. Submit yourself to their authority. Submit yourselves in a marriage, even if your spouse is not nice and abusive. Submit yourself in your place. And he specifically talks about wives in that regard, but then also husbands as well. In Ephesians chapter 6, it starts with, children, obey your parents. That's submission. In, in 1 Peter chapter 5, it talks about elders. I'm sorry, the younger submitting to the elder. And then it says, all of you submit to one another. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you, for they look out for your souls. It's talking about submission to the elders of a church. So the entire scope of the Christian life is bathed in this idea and principle of submission. And so if we criticize a church or a school or some institution that we work for, or even your workplace, by the way, because they're too strict, they're making me do this, and I don't really want to. I don't think that's right. Well, it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what God's Word says. And if you're not violating a principle of Scripture, then by calling them legalistic because they have very strict standards, you've just made yourself guilty of what you're accusing them of. And that's why Paul stresses this fact, and Jesus stresses this fact, stop judging other people because you violate the principle of loving one another. And by the way, if you get offended because somebody judges you, I already mentioned this, but you've fallen right into the trap as well. You will not get offended when people judge you if you're following the Lord. Psalm 119, 165, it's one of my favorite psalms. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Nothing. I will not get personally hurt because someone criticized me. What is the law that God is talking about? The law of Christ. Love God, love one another. And so if somebody hurts you, or criticize you, or calls you a legalist, or you think they're a legalist because they're criticizing you, don't get hurt by it. Forgive them, because that's what love does. And move on. Nothing will offend them. That's God's law. And you cannot offend or cause a stumbling block to other people by having a more conservative standard, ever. Because stumbling blocks and offenses are causing someone to sin. Now, Paul, I read this last week in 1 Corinthians 9, and i got to finish up. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul basically gives us his passage. He says, though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself a servant to all. There's the submission that I might gain the more. He's talking about in the context of the gospel and bringing people to Christ. And he goes, I become a Jew so that I can win the Jews. I become a Gentile so I can win the Gentiles. I'm willing to give up whatever it takes. I'm willing to do whatever it takes within God's law to win people to Christ. And Paul said here he adopted the stricter standards of the Jews even when he didn't have to so that he didn't cause them offense. He took a more conservative stance in order to avoid the offense. See, it's when you try to force someone into a more liberal or your way of thinking that you cause the offense. The meat offered to idols, the ones causing the offense were those who did eat, not the ones who didn't. Those, that's who Paul addresses. And when you try to force a more conservative, I'm sorry, when you try to force your standard, whether it's more conservative or less conservative, it's still legalism. But you will not offend somebody by adopting a more conservative standard because that's what they have. It's impossible. Paul makes it very clear. Most Christians who complain about the strict standards of other Christians don't have a biblical basis for their position. That's the problem. Either they've cherry-picked some verses or proof texts, or they've not studied it at all and just are going by 
general feeling and what their preferences and opinions are. But the point is this. God has not called any of us to judge any, of other, any other of us. We are not each other's judges. Whether you're more conservative or more liberal, whether you think you're better or worse, stop comparing yourself to someone else. Because that ends in nothing but sin. For you and possibly for other people. Look at verse 12 one more time. We're going to finish up here. Paul says, Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You are responsible to God. Do you love other people the way you should? Doesn't matter anything else, what other people do, doesn't matter. If they don't love you, do you love other people the way God wants you to? End of story. We are all accountable to God for ourselves, not for other people. And so Paul makes it very clear here when he says, judge not. Jesus makes it very clear in Matthew 7, judge not. Legalism is obviously a part of that. We don't call it judging anymore. We put it in the context of legalism. But here's the, the thing I want to leave you with. Because uh, thankfully, we don't have a problem, a big problem with this in our church, okay? But if you look at others and say, oh, well, you're a legalist. Guess what you've just done? You've condemned yourself. We could talk about this for another hour. Uh, I've had discussions that have gone longer, but we're out of time today. But I hope you understand that when you start applying all the principles of God's truth in your life, it changes the way you have to live. It changes the way you have to think about other people and how you live with other people. So let's not judge. Let's let God lead us into all doing what we're supposed to be doing and be accountable to him for how we live our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you're teaching us through your scripture, through the truth that you've given, Lord, and help us to apply it in the way that you want us to. Lord, help us to avoid making ourselves the standard or ever comparing ourselves to other people. You are the only one that is the judge. You are the only one that is the standard. And by your standard, we all fail. And so we're all in the same boat. But help us to encourage, to edify, to build up, and to love each other as we all are on this journey together. And we'll let you do the judging as we get to the end of our lives. Praying and knowing that you are faithful in your promises, that we have glory to look forward to. But Lord, convict us if there's sin that needs to be taken care of and that you need to remove. May we each be accountable to you as you've told us. Thank you again for your t lessons today and for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close with His Way with Thee, 367.